So people tease me uh, that I've never learned to use PowerPoint. And in fact, the only, as you can see, the only programs I have learned to use are Outlook for email and Word for my articles and books. So I'm an embedded reporter among you. I didn't prepare any visuals for you today because I didn't know how to prepare them. But that's OK. This is a symposium about literacy. And believe it or not, science has shown that literacy is first and foremost a listening skill. Study after study has shown that it's much harder to teach the deaf to read than the blind. Now, why is that? Well, think about it. Those squiggles on the page, or now on the screen that we call letters, are nothing more than signals to our brain to hear or make certain sounds. Just as those groups of squiggles on the page that we call words are nothing more than a series of sounds that signal to our brain to imagine certain things. A dog, blue, love, love. If you can't hear the sounds in love, you can't say or read the word love. And if you can't say or read the word love, you can't trigger your brain to think about and enjoy and maybe agonize over this thing called love. Raise your hand if you know that song, What is This Thing Called Love? Anyone? Oh, not bad. So reading is all about hearing and listening. Being able to read means, before anything else, being able to listen. Good readers are good listeners. So that's why I don't use visual aids in my presentations. I want you all to be good listeners. And I want to challenge myself to be worth listening to. I don't want to cheat and give you a bunch of pictures that your brains can sit back and passively absorb like a little kid watching TV. I want to make your brains work to create your own pictures from the sounds that you hear. I want to get you to exercise that fundamental skill that is at the very base of that pyramid of skills on which literacy is built. The skill, the habit, the reflex of generating a mental image from sound. Now, television and computer screens are marvelous things, but to a poor child in a language-poor home, they are devastating because they keep the child's mind from having to exercise this basic impulse to generate pictures and meanings from sounds. The poor of yesteryear were easier to teach than the poor of today, in part because they had radios in their homes, and so they were more practiced at listening and making mental images from what they listened to. And that's where literacy begins. So no PowerPoints for me, just a lot of sound, which means you could close your eyes and sleep and you won't miss anything. <laughs> Uh, well, first, a little background about how I got here, a little bit more back. As she mentioned, I've been an investigative reporter, an independent investigative reporter for 30 years. And if I had to choose one thing I've written in all that time that I hope will outlive me, without hesitation, I'd choose Clear Teaching, my book on Siegfried Engelman and direct instruction. And I say this for two reasons. One, I'm convinced that DI is a revolutionary invention that can lift our nation like no other invention of our time. And two, I'm afraid that this invention will never really catch on in our schools and that millions of children today and in future generations will suffer needlessly as a result. And so if my book in some small way helps prevent some of that suffering by helping to keep DI alive after I'm gone, then I'll consider my life as a writer to have been well spent. By the way, I get no money for, I got no money for writing the book and I get no money for, for its sale, so I'm shameless in promoting it. <laughs> uh, I found out about DI through my son, Eddie. Eddie was lucky enough to go to a good middle school with a good principal. This was back in the 90s before the, when we lived in Atlanta, well before the cheating scandal. As one of those helicopter dads, I volunteered a lot at the school. I liked the principal so much that when he got promoted and put in charge of 35 schools, I followed him to his office downtown and became his volunteer research assistant. It was a natural role for an investigative reporter to play, since research is supposedly what we do before we write our articles. 
So I found out about D.I. and Engelman the way an investigative reporter finds out about criminals and scandals, by digging. Only instead of hunting for humankind's worst practices, as reporters tend to do, I was hunting for educators' best practices. So over the next three years, I worked with my former son's principal to put DI in eight schools in Atlanta. And I was so amazed at how well it worked and so disturbed that so few people used it and so taken with Engelman, who is not just a genius but a really colorful character, that I decided I just had to write about it all. And that's how clear teaching grew out of my life as a parent volunteer. Now for a more personal story and uh, a bit embarrassing. At about the midpoint of my life as a writer, Eddie's language arts teacher asked if I would come in for a day to teach a writing workshop. It was part of an initiative they had in Atlanta called Writer's Week in the latter part of January. I was surprised to get the invitation because, to be honest, by that time in my son's education, this would be seventh grade, I had earned a reputation among his teachers. Busy buddy would be the polite way to describe it. Piranha mom, except I was a dad, and those are even worse. There's a street in downtown Baltimore called Eager Street. Well, I personified it. Eager to help, eager to tell teachers how to do their jobs, eager to have them implement my ideas for what they should be teaching in their classrooms. I was so sure of myself that when Eddie was in third grade, I wrote a column in the local newspaper explaining why a certain social studies book his teacher was using was no good, why it was totally unhelpful to her and useless to her students. It was a ringing defense of the teacher, I thought, a rousing call for textbook companies to give her something better, something more worthy of her calling, more useful to her in the classroom. Rereading the column, I thought to myself, boy, this is good. She'll be grateful I wrote it. It reduced her to tears. You fool, my wife exclaimed after the calamity. What were you thinking? Who are you? You know so much, you haven't taught a day in your life. Write about something you know or don't write at all. Dad, Eddie chimed in helpfully. He was eight at the time. Dad, he said, you wouldn't last a day at my school. <laughs> Disrespectful child, unsupportive wife. I pouted. So yes, I was surprised that a parent so notorious for being such a menace would be invited into any classroom to do anything except maybe bring some cookies and keep quiet. Of course, I was thrilled and flattered. Here was my big chance. Now I'll show them, I thought. If there's one thing I know, it's how to write. If there's one thing I love, it's writing. I'll just teach those seventh graders what my editors taught me. I'll talk about the importance of concrete nouns and active verbs, the dangers of purple prose, why it's bad to use too many adjectives and adverbs, how to avoid run-on sentences like this one. I'll find great examples from the newspaper, from great writers that are easy to read, like George Orwell or Mark Twain, two of my favorites. I'll even use a quote from the Bible, from Ecclesiastes, the bit about how time and chance happeneth to them all. I'll engage their interest and make it fun and win them over by telling them how, me how the meaning of that beautiful biblical passage can be reduced to a simple bumper sticker. I'll make them guess the two words on the bumper sticker, and if they can't, I'll delight in telling them. Here's the passage. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Time and chance happeneth to them all. What does it mean in two words? Think of a crude bumper sticker. Any guesses? Shit happens. Very good, shit happens. <laughs> Those seventh graders, they'll love it, I said to myself. So that was my lesson plan. It took me eight hours to prepare it, four hours a day over two days. And just as an aside, I'm always curious to hear people complain that programs like DI come with carefully designed lesson plans for the teacher. In my own experience writing lesson plans, my one lesson plan, I found the effort exhausting, 
fun for a while, but ultimately exhausting. And I simply can't imagine having to do it day after day at any grade level for any subject, even writing the subject I know and love best. So anyway, I sweep into Samuel Inman Middle School with my sheath of writing samples from Orwell, Ecclesiastes, the newspapers and the rest, walk through the door into Miss Quinona's seventh grade class and start teaching. This is 12 years ago. What happened next remains a complete blank to me to this day. I suspect my subconscious mind has blocked it out. You know, the way the mind suppresses the memory of traumatic experiences to help you carry on in life. Now, I remember it the way I remember my earliest memory. When I was two years old, I apparently backed my mom's car out of the driveway, through a fence, and into the bathroom of the house across the street. I remember distinctly the moments before the act, my mom leaving me in the car for a minute while she moved an empty baby carriage into the neighbor's yard. And I remember the moments after the act, my mom walking me back through the driveway, holding my hand, both of us crying. But I don't remember the act itself, putting the car in reverse, feeling it move, feeling it hit the fence, feeling it hit the house, hearing the bathroom pipes burst. That's what the memory of my first and last day teaching in a classroom is like. I remember everything I did before, and I remember how I felt after, but I don't remember the act of teaching itself. I'm guessing I must have put on quite a show because I remember feeling exhausted afterwards and overwhelmed at the realization that, drained as I was, in less than 10 minutes I would have to do the whole thing over again for the next class. Now whether the experience was more draining for me or for poor Miss Quinones, I can't say. Whether the kids learned anything from my lesson plan and just what they learned, I also can't say. Whether I had inspired in them a fuller appreciation for the power of words, I haven't a clue. Whether word got back to the principal that one of the words I had used to inspire such an appreciation was not entirely appropriate, I know not. Shit happens, as the bumper stickers say. So my son was right. I didn't last a day in the classroom. To say I gained a new respect for teachers and the teaching profession from the experience understates the case and is patronizing to all of you. Uh, no, what the experience taught me was that I was not put on earth, this earth to be a teacher and that those of you who were are very different creatures from me and that if I or anyone else in the world ever really understood what it is that teachers do each day, every day, day after day, we would be awestruck at just how difficult it is. Now the other thing my two hours as a writing teacher taught me is that it's hard to communicate, or rather, it's hard to communicate clearly. It's not even clear how to be clear. It takes a special sort of mind to write lessons that teach clearly what we want to teach, and teach it so clearly that not just some of our students understand, or even most of our students understand, but so that all of our students understand. And just as it would be unfair to expect me, as a writer, to also be a good teacher, it is unfair, I think, to expect teachers to be good writers of lessons. Because teaching and writing are two very different skills. And I learned that the hard way. Both are hard. You can't wing it with either. Both require endless attention to detail. But the details of these two callings, and they are callings, both of them, are very different. So now that you know a little bit more about me and that I'm not cut out to be a teacher, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about teaching. <laughs> now, in the time I have left, I want to convince you of four essential facts about teaching that a lot of people refuse to accept. And stealing from Al Gore, I'll call these facts inconvenient truths. So inconvenient truth one. Most teachers do not know how to write good lesson plans. Inconvenient truth two. Most programs, core or intervention, will not work for the bottom 
quartile or third of your students. Truth three, most learning failures are caused by bad programs, not by bad teachers or bad children. Truth four, students learn more and faster when they are taught at their ability level, not at their grade level. They should therefore always be taught according to their ability level, not according to their grade level. But enough lecture, let's play a game. Here's how it works. I'm going to make up a nonsense word for a familiar concept and try to teach it to you without using its regular name. I'll present you with examples of the concept, and you try to figure out what the concept is on the basis of those examples. OK, here we go. I'll call the concept by the nonsense word mert. This is an example of mert. And this is an example of mert. And this is an example of mert. So what's mert? How many people think mert is a writing utensil? How many people think mert means the color black? How many people think mert means up? All three answers are entirely logical based on the examples I presented. So how can you tell which answer is correct? You can't, because the examples I used to teach you the concept don't tell you. So let's try again. This is mert. This isn't mert. This is mert. This isn't mert. Now, so what's mert? Up, right, up. See how important it is to choose the right examples when you're teaching something? In this case, to teach the concept clearly, I also had to include an example of what mert isn't. Now, this is one of the exercises Engelman uses to teach instructional design. His point is to make us aware of the minefield teachers must navigate to avoid generating confusions in their students. It's also to show us that the mind is lawful and logical, not random and capricious. What we humans learn is perfectly consistent with the input we receive. The simplest object you can find, like this pen, is an example of an indefinitely large number of concepts. It follows that if you want to teach one of the things for which this pen is an example of, something to write with, something that's black, something that's up, you have to order your presentation of examples so that you rule out all the other possibilities. Now, that is very hard to do, actually. But if there is more than one possible interpretation of what you presented, it's guaranteed that at least some of your kids are going to pick up on the wrong one. And the lower performing your kids are, the more often they're going to pick up on the wrong interpretation. They'll learn what we call a misrule, or what Engelman calls a misrule. Now, the example I gave you was pretty dumb. I mean, how many of us would be dumb enough to teach up the way I tried to teach it? So I'll give you a better example, one we all know. The most common and debilitating misrule kids learn in this country concerns fractions. Most adults, when asked, will say a fraction is what? A number less than one. You hear that all the time. That's because as children, we were introduced to the concept with a misleading set of examples. One half, one third, one fourth. This sequence actually used to be mandated in some states, which is perfectly absurd. In fact, the biggest problem teaching higher math to kids is that they don't understand fractions, so they can't manipulate them. So after spending months working on problems where the numerator is always one, they are unable to do problems like two-thirds of nine or four-thirds of 12. They don't understand what the numbers mean. You can even predict the mistake these kids are going to make just by looking at the examples they've been taught with. For instance, let's say you have a set of, I don't know, 42 problems. And let's say not one of them has a problem type like two-fourths times six-fourths, you know, where the numerator is different and the denominator is the same, well, then you really don't know if your students know the difference between multiplication and addition operations. It's guaranteed that at least some of your students will be confused and just simply multiply the numerator and say two-fourths times six-fourths is 12-fourths. You know, two times six is 12, and the four stays the same. When we all know two-fourths times six-fourths equals what? 
12 sixteenths or three quarters. But don't worry, this isn't a math class. It's a literacy symposium. So let's talk about reading. The reading teacher runs a veritable obstacle course of misrules. Teach with a picture book, and some children will think that words are deciphered by looking at pictures. Teach with a rhyming book, and some will think that words can always be deciphered by looking at the first letter. Tell them to figure out a strange word by looking at how long it is or how, by thinking of words that make sense in context. And some kids will think that the length of a word or its placement with others tells more about the word than the letters in the word itself. Teach new letters by presenting them always at the beginning of words, and some kids will have problems identifying the letter when it's in the middle of the word, etc. Teaching letters by turning them into familiar objects, I've seen this a lot, like an H made to look like a house. And some kids will confuse houses with H's and will be unable to recognize H's in regular fonts. Teach sounding out for too long, and some kids will become confused by words like said and was because they can't be sounded out. And the thing is, every subject is an obstacle course of potential misrules like that. And that means any curriculum, any program worth its salt has to cope with this dilemma by specifying the precise sequence of examples, the tasks, and yes, even the wording teachers will need to teach their subjects clearly without causing confusion. Very few curricula do this, which is why most programs on the market do not work reliably, except for those kids who are easier to teach and for those teachers who are your best teachers. So the next time you see a teacher struggling to teach something in class, don't blame the teacher, blame the program, because chances are he or she is struggling with a program that's poorly designed. And that's what I meant when I said most learning failures are caused by bad programs, not bad teachers. That's one of those truths with enormous implications that almost no one understands. Most learning failures are caused by bad programs, not bad teachers. And the reason is that teaching and program design interact. So if the program design is weak, as it is when misleading examples are presented, like one half, one third, one fourth, more involved teaching is required to bring students to mastery, which means that the children learn more slowly and they receive feedback that they're, you know, they're not very successful learners. Most programs assume too much. They assume that the teacher can create the proper example set use proper wording for the examples, sequence the examples properly, correct specific mistakes effectively, reteach specific skills effectively, and make what is taught today consistent with what will be taught tomorrow and in the future. These are all elitist assumptions that are unfair to the teacher. There is no evidence to suggest, or very little evidence to suggest, that teachers can create effective teaching from programs that are not very explicit and carefully sequenced. If there are mistakes in the program, or if the program is vague or leads them to a dead end, they'll know something is wrong, but they won't know how to fix it. It's not because teachers don't know how to teach. It's because there's an enormous difference between teaching and designing effective instruction. And if you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at all those professors who give you broad brush strokes about how to teach and then leave you to figure it out all the details in the classroom because they don't know how to do it. Here's my favorite example of one of those broad brush strokes. Teachers are told over and over again, give clear and detailed instructions and explanations. The irony of this commandment to be clear is that it's so vague. Where do most teachers learn to give clear and detailed instructions and explanations? The answer is nowhere, they don't. Using clear, consistent wording is one of the hardest things to teach teachers or anybody in one of their most serious deficits, and it's a real problem. Because when a teacher uses inconsistent wording, her children make far more mistakes than they do when she uses variations of the same wording. They tend to become confused, whereupon the teacher then tries to explain what they should be doing, and this explanation introduces still more variant wording and simply confuses the kids even more. Again, this is not the teacher's fault, it's the program's fault for being too broad brush and vague. So 
to repeat and using the exact same wording, there is an enormous difference between teaching and designing effective instruction. That's another one of those big inconvenient truths that no one appreciates. Designing effective programs is a peculiar skill that almost nobody does well or even recognizes as a skill. And it's really hard. There may be a half dozen ways to do it right, but there are an infinite number of ways you can get it wrong. The Wright brothers, this is a good analogy, the Wright brothers had to orchestrate thousands of details to make a flying machine. If any one of those pieces had been missing or misconstructed or out of place, the machine would have failed and the plane would have crashed. Well, so it is with designing educational programs. The program has to be an orchestration, a symphony of detail if you want all your kids to fly. McGraw-Hill sells Zig Engelman's direct instruction programs, the most effective, carefully designed programs on the market, I think. Each program takes Zig and his team anywhere from three to 10 years to develop. The process includes exhaustive field testing and endless revision. A very bright master's student in Zig's instructional class once confessed to me that it took her 17 hours to design a five-minute sequence. 17 hours to design a five-minute sequence to teach a concept, a single concept to mastery to all of her kids. In other words, so that it worked. Expecting teachers to match that effort is unrealistic and unfair. It would be like asking the pilot of a 747 to also design the plane, or the actor in Shakespeare to write the play, or the conductor of a symphony to compose the score. I think Mr. Shin talked about that earlier today. So that's why the proverbial good teacher is no substitute for a good program. You need both, obviously. A good program makes your weak teacher adequate, your adequate teacher good, and your good teacher great. And I experienced this firsthand. My attempt to write my own lesson plan to teach writing to my son's seventh grade class was pretty much a failure. And back when my son was in elementary school, I tried using one of his teacher's lesson plans to tutor a second grader in reading. This was a good teacher. That too was a failure. It wasn't until I discovered DI many years later that I finally succeeded in teaching something to a kid who was struggling a little. Now, although by no means a teacher, I can proudly say now that using DI, I taught a poor little girl to read. The girl, Ladesia, had been left back when was, and was repeating first grade. Using a DI program, I was able to teach her an entire level, grade level, in 70 days. Moreover, I was able to accomplish this with very little training. Her teachers were thrilled and amazed, but what they failed to understand was that it wasn't I who deserved the credit, it was DI, or rather it was Engelman's genius in designing the program, because I never could have done it without the program. But enough personal anecdotes. There's an old saying among scientists, in God we trust, all others bring data. I don't know if you... So what do the data say happens when districts and teachers try to piece together their own curricula and write their own lessons, as they're now doing all over the country? The best evidence we have comes from a monumental study that the federal government sponsored back in the 70s called Project Follow Through. Raise your hand if you've heard of Follow Through. Four, five, okay. Project Follow Through was the largest and most expensive experiment in history to compare different approaches to instruction in the early grades. It tracked more than 75,000 kids, at-risk kids, in 170 communities from kindergarten through the end of third grade. It included 22 methods of instruction, most of which are still around today. It lasted two decades, and it cost taxpayers a billion dollars. It is the largest single data set we have showing what works and what doesn't work to teach at-risk kids. So what were the results of follow-through? Guess which methods of instruction were found to be least effective? The ones that were homegrown, devised by individual districts, their curriculum specialists, and their teachers. Guess which method of instruction did best? Engelman's direct instruction. Students were tested on language skills, reading, spelling, and math. DI students did best on all subjects, all four subjects, and not by a little either. I mean, they lapped the field. 
They also scored highest on tests designed to gauge their self-image and sense of responsibility, you know, which makes sense because you know, when you're successful, you generally kind of feel good about yourself. Um, so more than 100 studies since follow-through have confirmed various aspects of its findings. And meanwhile, the homegrown methods continue to fail the kids who are most at risk of failure. But this isn't a talk about DI. It's a talk about the importance of choosing good programs for your teachers, programs that have been designed using the scientific method and that have been tested for quality assurance the way medicine or airplanes or any important product is designed and tested for quality assurance. 30 years since follow through, very few programs are designed in this rigorous way. Most fail at least a third of our kids, mostly poor kids. And our teachers, of course, get blamed for their failures. Worse, our kids get blamed for their failures. They get labeled learning disabled. Their parents get labeled bad parents. How do we know this is true? Well, 25 years ago, a professor of psychology did a famous study that reviewed the cases of 5,000 students who were evaluated by school psychologists to determine why they were doing poorly in class. All 5,000 evaluations attributed the students' problems to deficiencies in the child and the child's family. Not one, not one of the 5,000 linked the students' problems in any way to faulty programs or practices. Not one. I mean, talk about bias. Talk about calling them for the hometown team. Talk about blaming the victim. Now, as educators, we must turn this toxic blame the victim thinking on its head. We must begin, as Engelman did, with the fundamental truth that every child, even the least impressive, is an incredible thinking machine gifted with extraordinary powers to learn, and that every teacher, given the right programs and training, can teach every child. Now, the best programs are written by people who have lots of experience accelerating the performance of at-risk kids. And that's because what works to teach at-risk kids is often counterintuitive and the opposite of what you'd expect. I'll give you my favorite example. And I still don't understand why this is true, but it evidently is. Low performers have much more trouble learning patterns of numbers than random sequences of numbers. Now, for most of us, it's the reverse, right? But for low performers, anything that's patterned will interfere with their learning. Thus, a sequence like 2, 2, 4, 4 is harder for them to repeat and remember than a sequence like 2, 5, 4, 1. Now, if you didn't know that, and you tried to teach, and why would you know that? And, and if you didn't know that and you tried to teach at-risk kids the commutative principle, you wouldn't realize how much more practice they're going to need. So if you say to these kids, 8 plus 1, turn it around, 1 plus 8, your turn, 8 plus 1, turn it around. Nothing. They can't do it. 20 trials later, they still can't do it. Whereas most other kids pick it up, you know, in a heartbeat. Now, patterns are just one thread in a tapestry of thousands of things that we think are obvious, but that at-risk kids don't understand. For example, third graders, when shown a picture of a sinking ship leaning to one side, they can't tell you which direction the deck chairs will slide. They have no concept of gravity. Now, your program has to be designed to explicitly teach this tapestry of things, because few of your teachers will have the time or ability to figure them all out for themselves, much less how to teach them all. But let's take a break and play another game. I'm going to try to teach you something again, not with pens. It's an old screen test for radio announcers from back in the 1940s. Here it is. Listen, one hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four lyrical oysters, five corpulent porpoises, six pair of Don Elverso's tweezers, 7,000 Macedonians in full battle array, eight brass monkeys from the ancient sacred crypts of Egypt, Nine sympathetic, apathetic old men on roller skates with a marked propensity towards procrastination and sloth. Ten lyrical, spherical, diabolical denizens of the deep who haul squall around the corner of the quay with a quiver 
all at the same time. Okay, now repeat after me. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese. Your turn. Almost. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese. That was the easy one. My turn. Four lyrical oysters, five corpulent porpoises, six pair of Don Alverso's tweezers. Your turn. With me. Four lyrical oysters, five corpulent por porpoises, six pair of Don Alverso tweezers. My turn. 7,000 Macedonians in full battle array, eight brass monkeys from the ancient creeps of sacred Egypt, nine sympathetic, apathetic old men on roller skates with a marked propensity towards procrastination and sloth. Your turn. Never mind. Last one. Ten lyrical, spherical, diabolical, etc. You get it. So it helps to put ourselves in the learner's shoes sometimes. And I've just put you in the same position we put millions of kids in every year. I didn't give you enough practice to master what I was trying to teach you. In the same way, kids, particularly at-risk kids, rarely get enough practice to master what we're trying to teach them. And that's because, as adults, we forget how much time and effort it takes to learn and remember new things. Once we master something, we feel like we've always known it, right? We, indeed, we can't even imagine a time when we didn't know it. Even as we learn it, we're unaware of the knowledge and habits of mind we may have that help us learn it. Most curriculum writers, being smart adults, write programs that try to teach too many things way too fast. Most reading programs, or certainly a lot of them, for example, introduce too many letter sounds too quickly. Their pacing and sequencing is all wrong, and so the kids struggle. Here again, it's not the teacher's fault, it's the program's fault. Repetitio mater memoriam. Say it with me. Repetitio mater, oh, it's not that late, guys. Repetitio mater memoriam. Again, with me. Repetitio mater memoriam. Okay, now by yourself. Good. Now that's an old Latin proverb from ancient Rome. It means repetition is the mother of memory. The modern day version of this Latin proverb is practice makes perfect, or rather, actually, perfect practice. Practice makes permanent, perfect practice makes perfect, but you get the idea. Now, every year, science discovers things about the mind that explain why repetition and practice are so important. The latest brain research, for instance, shows that learning to read, write, and do math requires far more memorization than most of us ever realized. Now, more memorization requires what? More practice. Programs like the eye that include lots and lots of practice are often derided as what? Drill and kill. Well, drill and thrive would be closer to the truth. Because if you haven't been drilled on your times tables, you won't remember them. And if you don't remember them, you'll never be able to learn algebra. And if you aren't drilled on your 220 sound symbols, by the way, that passage I had you try to remember is only 78 words, and this is 220 sound symbols that the kids have to learn. If you're not drilled on them, you'll never learn to read fluently enough to comprehend what you're reading. Here's another point about the exercise I just dragged you through. Some of you will need more time than others to memorize that radio announcers test. In the same way, some beginning readers will need a lot more practice than others to master the alphabetic code or the meaning of a new word. Now, how much practice depends in part on what the learner already knows going into the task. Adults, and I'm sure you know some, who are good at memorizing things, have picked up tricks that will help them master the passage faster. I'm sure if I tested how long it took each of you to memorize the passage thoroughly enough to recite it from memory six months from now, the results would vary quite a lot. It's the same with children. Children or parents who talk to them a lot will have learned more about sounds, words, and the learning process than their less fortunate peers. So they'll learn those sounds faster, sound symbols faster, and learn to read faster. The same holds true for memorizing math facts or musical notes. Fast learners are fast in part because they have less to learn. Here's the good news. Given a well-designed curriculum, differences in learning rates 
in children tend to be smaller than differences in starting points, what children start out knowing how to do. The problem is that these differences in learning rates get much bigger when we refuse to acknowledge the differences in those starting points, when we pretend that they don't exist, or when we feel like we just don't have enough time to deal with them, right? And unfortunately, we make this mistake all the time in schools all around the country, and that's the bad news. I'll give you just one example, and not from a low-achieving district, but from one of the best. It's a district I've actually written about. Idea Public Schools is a network of 32 charter schools in South Texas. Every year it gets rated by the Texas Education Agency as one of the top performing districts in the state. Last year it won a $30 million race to the top grant, and this year it's been named as a finalist for the Eli Broad Prize. 83% of Idea's students are poor, 95% are Hispanic. Those students go to and graduate college at six times the rate of comparable students elsewhere, 600%. Now one big reason IDEA succeeds is because it uses the DI programs reading mastery and connecting math concepts as core programs. So clearly IDEA is a very strong district, but last year IDEA made a big mistake. Beginning in August, it placed its students in grades three through five at their grade level in the DI reading and math programs instead of at their ability level. So students were given tasks that the state of Texas thinks they should be able to form, perform at their age instead of tasks they actually can perform. Kids below grade level were thus given tasks much too difficult for them, like manipulating fractions before they knew their times tables or reading long, complex sentences before they could read simpler ones. No one who understands how children learn would drop them in over their heads in a well-designed program. That would be like me dropping all of you into advanced physics before you'd mastered calculus. Colleges never do that to adult learners, and yet we do this with children all the time. Now, IDEA's actions, as you may have guessed, were brought on by its fear of not doing well on the state test. IDEA's director was determined that his students, who were not performing at grade level, would nevertheless learn grade level content in time for the test. But students who are presented with tasks that require them to master too much too quickly learn less and more slowly, not more or more quickly. Three months into the school year, the children who were not placed appropriately at IDEA were progressing through DI lessons at less than half the rate that they had been when they were placed according to their abilities. Now the irony is that IDEA's spring 2013 test results showed that most kids who were performing at grade level in the DI programs also did well on the test. So the most sensible strategy thus would have been to just keep the students at their ability level where their lesson progress would have been much faster so that more of them got closer to their grade level and did better on the test. IDEA's placement strategy did exactly the reverse. It threw kids in over their heads, confused them, disheartened them, wrecked their confidence, and slowed their learning to a crawl. The tragedy is that this happens routinely wherever there are kids who are performing below grade level, but who are faced with having to take a grade level state test, which is pretty much everywhere in the country, right? And one of the great myths in education is this myth of exposure that by exposing kids who are below grade level to grade level standards, they will somehow learn them, or at least enough of them, to do better on the test. That's the word I always hear, expose them to the standards. We've got to expose them to the standards. Yeah, right. How about I expose you all to second year Latin before teaching you the basics of declension? Raise your hand if you know how to decline the Latin word for love. No one? Oh, sir. That's what I figured. So, I don't know. How much would your exposure to second year Latin help you? How much would you learn? I dare say you wouldn't learn nearly as much Latin in Latin two as your neighbor would learn if I put her in Latin one where she belongs. And if God forbid both of you were forced to take Latin two, a Latin two exam at the end of the year, Neither of you would do well, but guess who would do better? She would, right? The same goes for your students. The most important rule, and the, possibly the most difficult one to teach your teachers, 
is that you have to start as close as possible to where the learner performs, and you have to teach the mastery. And you can't achieve mastery if you didn't introduce tasks that are far beyond the learner's ability, like my putting you in Latin too. And you can't achieve mastery if you don't give the learner enough practice, like I did to you with those nine old men and ten spherical denizens, etc. So make haste slowly. You've got to live by that proverb. You've got to go slow to go fast. Now, you'll notice I haven't talked today at all about the Common Core or technology or other recent trends in education. And that's because at the end of the day, I really don't think they will change things all that much. I mean, ask yourselves, has the Common Core or the computer changed the human brain, the learning mechanism inside of it? Has it changed the letters of the alphabet or the way our eyes and ears process those letters? Has it changed our number system, or what a fraction is, or what logic or comprehension or algebra is? Has it changed what works best to teach these things, especially to low performers? No, it hasn't. Devise whatever tests and standards you want. Mother Nature will not be fooled. Our brains are still the same and need what they've always needed in order to learn. Now, good teachers, of course, know this. The kids never lie a DI trainer once told me. The information they give you should feel like somebody hitting you over the head with a brick. If it doesn't, you're not teaching, you're just presenting. Because if you've walked that bridge from presenting to teaching, then teaching is never boring because a kid can make a mistake in a million different ways. Now that's what's so exciting about teaching, she said, and so hard. And that's what an effective program helps you deal with. I want to go back to follow through just one last time because the biggest lesson from follow through is that training teachers is hard. Follow through basically was a horse race. 22 model designers entered the race. All 22 could point to individual schools that had had success with their models. What happened? 21 of the 22 models were unable to reproduce their success at scale. Every one of them experienced versions of the same problem, the inability to provide consistent, effective, replicable teacher training. Now, the saddest failure was a guy named Larry Gotkins. Larry Gotkin was an enthusiastic, very knowledgeable about instruction, very hardworking, and totally convinced that his two schools would be among the best. He spent most of his time at his schools teaching in the classrooms, observing and prompting teachers. But after the second year, he got depressed because the data showed that his schools were far from exemplary. The reason? Try as he may, he couldn't get teachers to implement his approach effectively. Here's another broad brush direction we give our teachers. Present new material in small steps with student practice after each step. Well, this was precisely the thing Gottgen tortured over getting teachers to analyze how many new skills their students would have to learn in response to different patterns of what was taught. Now, very few teachers have an intuitive sense of how to do this well, and most do it poorly after months of instruction. Engelman solved the problem by building the small steps and the practice into his programs. He admired Gottgen and tried to talk him into working with the DI model. Gottgen told him he might do that, Several weeks later, he killed himself, and his model was discontinued. So the moral of this tragic story and the message from follow through is to choose a program that works not only for all your students, but that your teachers can be trained to teach. Choose a program that has been shown to work not only in a handful of schools, but in hundreds of schools. 21 of the 22 models and follow through failed on that score. Only DI succeeded. It succeeded in scaling up back then in the 70s, and it is succeeding in scaling up right now at IDEA, which has grown from like one school to 32 schools in the last decade. Two more stories, and then we can all head to the bar, if there is one. How devastating is it that many of our schools do not adopt effective programs to teach children to read? 
Our prisons hold the answer. I'm sure you've heard that. The most common feature of the US prison population is not poverty. It's not race. It's illiteracy. If as a child your teachers fail to teach you to read, you won't necessarily grow up to become a criminal. But if you do become a criminal and go to prison, chances are your teachers or your programs fail to teach you to read. Now of the millions of illiterates who have spent time in prison, none is more notorious than mafia hitman Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano. Sammy the Bull was the son of law-abiding, church-going immigrants in Brooklyn. His dad ran a small dress factory and earned a decent living. Sammy attended PS 186 in Bensonhurst and was left back twice because he couldn't read. His teachers called him a slow learner. His classmates taunted him for being stupid until he started beating them up. At 13, he joined a street gang. At 16, he was so violent, his parents were forced to remove him from school. He earned his nickname, Fighting. He became involved with a mob at age 23 and committed his first murder at 25. He went on to commit at least 18 more murders. And those were just the ones he confessed to. Gravano stayed in the mafia for 23 years, rising to the rank of underboss in the Gambino crime family. In 1991, he became the highest ranking member of the five families to break his blood oath and turn informer. His testimony helped bring down family boss John Gotti. He pled guilty to a reduced charge of racketeering, got a five-year sentence, served time, entered and left the U.S. Federal Witness Protection Program, and went back into crime. At age 52, he published Underboss and was sued by the families of his murder victims for $25 million. At 57, he was convicted in Arizona of possession and distribution of a drug with a very long name. I can't pronounce, but it's known as ecstasy. He's currently serving a 19-year prison sentence at a maximum security prison in Colorado. He suffers from Graves' disease, which is a thyroid disorder that causes fatigue, weight loss, and hair loss. He's bald. He's lost his eyebrows. Gravano told his biographer that his contempt for authority began back in elementary school when teachers called him slow and classmates made fun of him for not knowing how to read. To this day, he is still a poor reader. He shows no remorse for his actions, and the system that failed him doesn't show much remorse either. His victims are still dead, their families still grieve, and too many schools still refuse to use reading programs that work. And now for a happy story. We all know bad teaching can destroy lives, but can good teaching rebuild lives damaged at birth? Well, Patrick Vinson was born to an alcoholic and had a stroke while being born. I promise it's a happy story. <laughs> the, the stroke damaged his brain so badly, his adoptive mother was told he would never learn to read, write, or do math. The mom, Linda Vinson, who I believe used to work at McGraw-Hill, began teaching him at home using Reading Mastery when he was five. Today, Patrick reads at an 11th grade level, writes fluently, and knows algebra. Diagnosed as moderately disabled, he graduated high school and earned a regular high school diploma, not the diploma awarded to disabled students for mastering less demanding skills. Linda Vinson once emailed me a description of Patrick's life now. I'll try to read it the way she wrote it, because it's filled with exclamation marks. My son Patrick is 20 years old and works for public supermarket. He just had his sixth anniversary as a full-time employee. He works 40 hours a week and is currently learning to run a register so he can become a cashier. He accomplished running the floor cleaning machine this year and cleans the entire store when he's scheduled to close. He's very independent. He has a checking account, savings account, 401k, and Roth IRA. His managers at Publix repeatedly tell us he is awesome, exclamation point. A wonderful worker, exclamation point. He spends his free time reading. We go at least once a week to the bookstore to purchase books. He has a large collection, approximately 300 books, that he has read and read and reread, exclamation point. He currently has 10 new books he's reading right now, exclamation point. He's computer smart 
exclamation point. He has a Facebook account and keeps in touch with lots of people. He has friends he corresponds with daily, some as far away as Australia. He often tells people about how he learned to read from his mom and how if it wasn't for direct instruction, he would not have learned to read, exclamation point. DI completely changed my life and his life. I taught him to read. He taught me never to give up. Never to give up. What a nice thing to learn. Well, thank you for listening to me today as an embedded reporter among you. I'm really honored to be here because what you do is a matter of life and death. The programs you choose may be a matter of life and death. So I hope you choose good ones. And I hope you don't ever give up, not on your students, not on your teachers, and not on yourselves. Thank you very much.